Cardinal George Pell of Australia, unjustly accused of abuse, spent 13 months in a prison in Australia in solitary confinement. We're here to talk with him about his story. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Losanti, and His Eminence Cardinal George Pell of Australia joins me now. Cardinal Pell is the former Secretary of the Economy at the Vatican, and he also served on Pope Francis's Council of Cardinals. On March 13, 2019, Cardinal Pell began what was meant to be six years in jail for, quote, historical sexual assault offenses, close quote. He endured more than 13 months in solitary confinement before the Australian High Court voted seven to nothing to overturn his original conviction. Cardinal Pell relives his prison experience in his books called Prison Journal. And the third and final volume of the journal he wrote while in prison has just been released, titled Prison Journal, Volume 3, The High Court Frees an Innocent Man. In this final volume of Cardinal Pell's journal, he recounts being freed from jail after his conviction was overturned, the support he received from all over the world, and how he made the decision to forgive his accusers. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, His Eminence Cardinal George Pell. Cardinal George Pell is our guest. Your Eminence, thanks for coming on the program. I have had the opportunity to go through the first uh, edition of the Prison Journal and love it. I'm looking forward to the next two. First question, Um, Mr. Navalny is in Germany safely. He goes back to Russia knowing Mr. Putin is probably going to put him in jail, and he does. Uh, Jimmy Lai, great Catholic, pro-democracy in Hong Kong, certainly as a billionaire, has the opportunity to get out of Hong Kong, stays put, and the government of China arrests him. Cardinal Pell, safe in Rome, but chooses to go back to Australia to an environment that he knows is a, is a kind of a lynch mob mentality when it comes to the church. Uh, why did you go home? Oh, well, I really, uh, there was no honorable alternative. Mm. Uh, I mean, I knew I was innocent. And I needed to go back home and establish that. If I'd stayed away, it would have been uh, seen by many as a uh, tantamount of an admission of uh, guilt. So it really wasn't uh, an option for me not to go back. It did, was did the you, only, only honorable thing to do. Did you know, though, that you were walking into a highly hostile environment? I knew it was very, very hostile, but I never... Uh, believe for a moment that I would be convicted yeah. uh, because the case against me was uh, so so weak. Okay. Were you advised by folks at the Vatican to stay put or, or were they open to the idea that you should go home and, and correct this thing? Um, no, no. Uh, they, uh, I think they realized I had to go home, but I never gave them any uh, opportunity to, uh, <laughs> right. uh, I, I had said that I was going home. Your Eminence, uh, one of the things that I find interesting as I read the uh, first journal is uh, the values that's made you the man that you are uh, obviously come from many places, but among them is the family of origin. So when I see a guy who's tenacious and uh, deeply uh, invested in his faith and loving God a lot, I say, what kind of family formed him? When you look back, I know you're 80 now, when you look back to the family that raised you, the parents that raised you, what did they do right and, and, and what did you learn from them? Oh, I, learned, I learned an enormous uh, amount from them. Uh, both of them were strong personalities. Mm-hmm. My father wasn't a Catholic. Uh, my mother was Irish-Australian. She, had, she was a Burke. She had seven sisters. Uh, the, uh, the Burke women never needed any feminist movement uh, <laughs> to remind them of their rights and of their capacity to stand on their own feet and express their point of view. So my mother was a very strong person, and so was my father. Um, uh, They both loved me. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was only later as a priest when I came to see uh, many families and and to see just how so many children uh, suffer uh, in some families 
that I realized how good my family was <laughs> because I knew that uh, my parents would do anything they could that was reasonable and good uh, to support me. I never for a minute uh, questioned their love or devotion to my welfare. And um, I had quite an extended family uh, from mum's side uh, in the, the city where I, Ballarat, where I uh, grew up. And the schools I attended in those days were uh, faith-filled schools. I couldn't tell you even now the youngsters in my class at school who didn't go to Mass. Wow. Um, because if you didn't go to Mass, you didn't talk about it. Right. Well, the, over, <laughs> the overwhelming majority of us, uh, of us did. Now, this non-Catholic non father, how well did he take the idea of his son embracing the Catholic priesthood? Oh, no, he thought it was a terrible waste of time. He was very, <laughs> he was very ambitious for me, yeah. and he thought it was uh, uh, a waste. Uh, he said it wouldn't have been bad if uh, he, he used the Australian firm of, uh, word dill. It means it, it wouldn't have been so bad if I was a bit of a fool, if I was stupid and incapable, but he, he thought it was a terrible waste because I had a bit of capacity that I'd be going off into the priesthood. Uh, and he point. changed as he, uh, as he went along and became increasingly sympathetic. He never became a Catholic. Okay. He was religiously tone deaf, although <laughs> nominally an Anglican Episcopalian, but uh, he, he wasn't. Uh, he was a man of principles, very decent man, very forthright man. Um, he wasn't well educated, but uh, he could speak the old Australian that existed uh, before television came in. Mm -hmm. uh, so he could be very pithy and direct and uh, uh, was an interesting conversationalist. The uh, experience of the Ignatian retreat I went on years ago, I remember thinking 30 days of silence, I can handle this. Uh, being alone with just my Bible. I found about two weeks into the Ignatian retreat, it's not easy to be alone. How did your eminence handle the experience in prison of loneliness? Well, I was trained um, in a pre-Vatican II seminary. Mm. So we used to have the great silence, right? As which would start at about six o'clock in the evening and went through till nine o'clock. Um, was a pretty well observed. Uh, we had silence at meals. At the lunchtime we had uh, the middle of the day, the, the main meal we had, uh, and then in the evening we had readings from the scriptures. So I said my time in a pre-Vatican II seminary <laughs> was a good preparation for jail. Um, but also another blessing in the jail I, I was only interrupted three or four times a day for roll calls or meals or sometimes mm -hmm. called to go to the doctor or the lawyer. But the, uh, uh, the warders, uh, when they would see you briefly, w would be friendly and have uh, not long conversations generally, but just a word or two. Now, it would have been very different if they were completely silent or snarling at you or hostile towards you. Um, and I was in isolation. There were 11 other isolated cells. And um, it was the biggest surprise in jail, how decent they were. And mm. as far as I could hear in the way they treated the other people in isolation, they were um, decent to them also. Very mm. difficult work because many of the people uh, in isolation were terribly ruined. Uh, by drugs. So they'd be angry and anguished and, um, uh, you know, some of them would uh, right. uh, protest. They'd uh, flood their cells or soil their cells. Not many, but some did. Some would refuse to move, so they'd have to uh, gas them and uh, take them out. That only happened once or twice. But a difficult, difficult work for the warders and in that part of the jail, at any rate, I think they did uh, a good job. Your Eminence, one of the uh, 
the things that uh, is striking to me is that you went back to Australia thinking, I'm innocent, so there's no real danger here. And then you get convicted with great, great bias. Uh, I mentioned that because then you go to jail and obviously you're hoping on appeal that things will change. But the real enemy there, it seems to me, is discouragement. When you really have such great hope and it's dashed by the unfairness of the process and then you're in jail, how do you keep hope alive? Like uh, you may believe you're innocent till the end of time, but you may spend the end of time in jail. How did you deal with the real crisis many of us face of discouragement when the unfair happens? Well, I think as priests, uh, uh, we have an obligation not to be discouraged. Mm. I mean, we're priests are leaders of their people. Uh, and now if we've got uh, a clinical depression or mm. we're physically run down, very bad flu, well, there's no alternative to being depressed. But sometimes bad morale of being discouraged can be sort of narcissistic. We're just uh, feeling sorry for ourselves. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, because we're priests and leaders, mm -hmm. we've got to keep ourselves together. Our, our, uh, uh, if we're in bad morale, it's not good uh, for the people that we serve. Now, one of the interesting things, if I slightly digress, about surveys, about priestly morale, I remember in one of the surveys, many, many of the priests said, oh, yes, morale amongst the priests is bad, but my morale is good. Mm. Uh, and I think there would be uh, an element of that. Uh, but nonetheless, we, uh, we have an obligation to... Uh, um, to keep ourselves together, do what we can mm -hmm. within the limits, uh, personal limits that we have. Uh, Cardinal Pell, the, uh, I, I'm a priest of the Diocese of Rockville Center in Long Island, New York. I mention that because my bishop for many years was a guy named John Armagan. Uh, he's dead now for over 20 years. People come forward recently and they say, oh, 50 years ago, he did something inappropriate. And suddenly his name is, is uh, sullied. I, I find myself as a man who knew him, lived with him, loved him, served him outraged by the fact that someone can be dead, cannot defend themselves, and someone comes up seeking, by the way, great financial reward and decides that 50 years ago he may have done something wrong. I don't find it easy to forgive those who accuse this good man. So I'm intrigued by you, who was so unfairly treated, uh, say in another interview I've seen, I've forgiven my accusers. How in the world, in your heart, have you found the capacity to forgive those who are so unjust? Well, I, um, um, one, I think it's a decision you make mm. and you hope your feelings follow. Um, and I, uh, I've never met my accuser, mm. but I saw him. Uh, he wasn't present in court, but he appeared through video. Uh, and he seemed to me to be a very, very damaged individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he has had. A nervous uh, trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, reputedly, uh, subsequently, reputedly, he said to someone that yeah, something did happen, but it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, certainly with him, I realized that uh, he's damaged goods. He's a victim too. Yeah. Uh, he has certainly suffered. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't as though uh, my accuser was somebody who's in the top of their game, the top of their form, uh, completely together and explicitly um, and clearly, clear-headedly malevolent. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent um, what he said was fantasy. I don't know to what extent it was uh, fiction. Um he did change his story 24 times, which mm. isn't a bad effort. But anyhow, I, I didn't find that too hard to, to forgive him. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, I got very cross with the lawyers, <laughs> yeah. uh, the opposition lawyers, because I felt that they were trying to confuse the situation rather than to bring light and to clarify it. But I suppose mm. it's that uh, uh, my own lawyers uh, said that probably – the prosecutor couldn't believe his luck yeah. when he managed to get a, uh, a jury after four or five days of discussion 
uh, to agree with him. In, in America, our own Cardinal Joe Bernadine, uh, falsely accused and suffered terribly, ultimately decides to meet with his accuser after it's all over and to let him know that uh, there's room for reconciliation. Do you anticipate there would ever be an opportunity for you to meet the man who made the accusation? I'd be happy to meet with him. I'd be interested as to whether he would, because mm -hmm. uh, I suspect I suspect he, he realizes he's got some unresolved business. Mm-hmm. Um, but once or twice during the uh, during the case during the trial, he paused and paused and paused, and I wondered whether he was going to say then, mm. uh, "Yes, you know, I've got this wrong." But then he rallied and he went on. Now that uh, I might have mistaken that one of my one of the lawyers in my team had a similar feeling, mm -hmm. but. Um, I mean, I'm certainly happy to meet with him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd uh, be inclined to say, look, I don't know you. I've never met you. Mm -hmm. There was no basic incident that could be developed uh, from which you might uh, uh, say that. See, it was uh, one of the, the difficulties is a lot of people in the Australian establishment have got no idea what a, a great cathedral is like after a big Sunday mass. Right, right. Hundreds of people present, 50 people in the choir, uh, 20 servers, 15 at any rate, uh, sacristans, and money counters, collectors, um, uh, all in uh, procession around. Uh, it's a very implausible setting right. uh, for a crime like that, especially on two... Uh, nobody mm -hmm. said that I knew the kids and they could have been uh, it was quite a, a good school they could have been uh, children of two judges um, or you know the, the police chief or anybody uh, it was totally implausible but so I I'd, uh, I'd certainly be prepared to meet them but I, I'd, I'd say you know all right then what's the story uh, Colonel Pell we had a uh our own president, Nixon, years ago, who was being interviewed by David Frost. And the question put to him was, um, the Democratic Congress obviously had no love for you, and the media certainly had no love for you. Uh, so did they do you in when it came to his uh, being driven from office? And President Nixon said, while they may have hated me, I gave them the sword that allowed them to do me in. In the same way, uh, in the church, uh, what mistakes have we made? How have we corrected them? How can we make sure this whole problem of abuse never happens again? Uh, um, well, the, the undoubtedly what soured public opinion was the pedophilia crisis, mm -hmm. uh, the extent and number of the crimes. Um, the second thing was that it wasn't always uh, well dealt with. Yeah. In a recent interview, uh, I, I pointed out that we set up national procedures for um, adjudicating these uh, crimes, providing co compensation and counselling in 96 and 97. That's about five or six years before the big Boston um, revelations. We got in uh, pretty early uh, on this. I was one of the pioneers, one of the first in the world to set up such a system was ironic in some ways uh, that I was uh, scapegoated or, or, or picked out. Um, so we've, um, I think the public is much uh, better informed about the danger of pedophilia. The uh, priests are, it, is, it wasn't spoken about, it was taboo. Um, a little bit like uh, today, uh, pedophilia in non-institutional situations. Uh, there's a big taboo on that, uh, on what happens in, uh, in families and outside institutions. People don't like to talk about it. I can, I can understand the, that. Uh, the pendulum has swung. Once upon a time, the victims would not be believed. Yeah. Uh, to some extent, unfortunately, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. Uh, and uh, people are inclined to jump 
the gun and say, if somebody's accused, they must be guilty. Yeah. Now, an important protector of civilization is the principle we have, certainly in the English speaking world, that a person is innocent right. until they're proved guilty. And that's important uh, to, main, uh, to maintain that. And um, you see, it's very easy. You mentioned this uh, the bishop who, uh, who's dead. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get rid of a problem. Somebody accuses somebody who's dead and say, oh, well, uh, I don't know whether it happens or not, but we'll give them some money and they'll go away. Uh, I would never cooperate to that mm -hmm. uh, in, in such an approach uh, because I said uh, each case um, should be investigated to the extent that it possibly uh, can be. And I was very reluctant unless there was overwhelming evidence uh, to go ahead and presume or conclude guilt uh, if this was the only case and it was 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very difficult to discern the truth there, but the presumption of innocence uh, should remain. Right, right. Now, let me ask you, uh, it's a leadership question related to everything you're saying. I had the privilege back in 1980 of forming a friendship with uh, Cardinal Basil Hume, and we maintained that until he died. But one of the things he said he thought was an advantage for him was that he did not come up through the church ranks. He was a, a monk and an abbot, and the, the choice of him as Archbishop of Westminster was a surprise. He thought, he said, that one of the problems sometimes in the step-up move of, of bishops and archbishops and cardinals is that uh, sometimes you get where you're going by going along to get along. Uh, and and keeping quiet, and that to rock the boat and say uh, we're doing this wrong, we've got to change directions for the church is not easy for a man who's moving through the ranks. Now mm -hmm. I say that with the exception, Cardinal Pell, of you, because the one thing everyone's always said is you kind of always spoke your mind, spoke your truth in season and out of season. But is it possible in terms of forming leaders? We don't necessarily pick leaders in the church who will say what they have to say no matter what, so that they would have said years ago, wait a second, we can't reassign a guy who's been accused of uh, offending children uh, to another parish until we're sure he's not really bothered with that particular malady. Um, what do we do to make sure leaders will lead? Uh, we can't guarantee that. We, we, we do our best. Mm -hmm. um, if I could say a word or two about the old situation. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably true that we didn't understand fully the damage that was done to the victims. Yeah. I think it was certainly true that most people didn't understand uh, how, I don't know whether the technical word is addictive, mm. uh, that uh, serious pedophiles, uh, you know, they might resolve to be good and because of the uh, force of habit find it almost impossible. We... Um, in the late 80s, perhaps early 90s, a lot of good bishops thought that by sending uh, uh, abusers off to psychological uh, clinics, they would be able to reform them. Well, that, uh, that didn't, um, uh, th that, that was a mistaken belief. But uh, often it was entered into uh, in the, with the best uh, intentions. Um, uh, but the temptation just to go along is exists in every society, <laughs> exists in religious life uh, too. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Cardinal Hume's monastery of Amplefort has had desperate trouble um, uh, itself, so much so it was threatened with deregistration. Wow. So it's... Um, uh, I think, by and large, we've got good leaders, Mm -hmm. um, now, when once you're in charge of a diocese, uh, you know, there's trouble enough that's forced on you. I can understand the instinct is not to look for trouble, but um, I too wonder about the, the past. Now, I, uh, I don't find it spectacularly difficult to understand 50 years ago if, some, if there'd been an isolated case and uh, the person seemed repentant and there might have been some psychological, uh, that they say, well, we'll give you another chance. Mm -hmm. But what I find very, very difficult, 
almost impossible to believe. And we had one such case in my diocese is uh, where there were repeated falls and repeated um, being sent uh, to, to somewhere else. Uh, uh, I just, uh, even <coughs> in terms of that day and age, um, I find that difficult to understand just how it, how it could happen. Your Eminence, we're running uh, to the end of this interview, and I wanted to end with one question that's important. Two of our great American Australians, uh, Ray Carrison, who wrote a great book on Bishop Walsh of Marinol, and uh, Matthew Kelly, who runs DynamicCatholic.com, two great Catholics of Australian extraction. But I mentioned that because I asked them the same question I want to ask you. Um, before the experience of accusation, when you would pray, how hard was it to accept the hardest challenge, I think, in our faith, thy will be done, and how well or how poorly do you think you embraced the command to truly accept the will of God when it was so patently unfair? Um, well, I think as a preliminary, it's good to be a realist. Mm. Some people said, you know, could you believe that you were where you were? And, yeah, I had no problem uh, accepting that I was in jail and that I was found guilty. Yeah. And then uh, you're in that situation, and you've got to try to make the best of it as a believing Christian. I want to thank Cardinal George Pell for being with us. I hope our listeners and watchers around the world will get hold of his journals. There are three editions, actually, three volumes. And, and, and your eminence, look, I, I could understand if after this thing you, uh, you took off and were never heard from again. I love the fact that you're willing to talk about the experience and share the ups and downs, the challenges to uh, faith, the difficulties of being falsely accused, the ability to forgive. Uh, thank you for being so articulate in, uh, in talking about this issue so openly and honestly. And, and do us a favor and, and live a long time so you can continue to change hearts and minds and bring more people back to the goodness of the church. That's very kind. Thanks, Monsignor. Thank you so much. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you have any comments to make, please send them to me at personallyspeakingpodcast at gmail.com. You can get past episodes on YouTube by going to Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. And don't forget to click like and subscribe. You can get other past episodes by going to personallyspeakingpodcast.buzzsprout or www.closeencountertv.com or www ollmp.org. Personally Speaking is also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. And now we're also on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer of Personally Speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.